So, the next topic that we are going to tackle, the next issue that we are getting into, is definitely an issue that, according to our, let's say, humble opinions, meaning the board members of Sport Business School Finland, is one of the indefinite futures of sport marketing and, and partly sport management as well. And actually we tried, we have been trying to find uh, some kind of a way to, to bring this topic to this program previous years. And uh, now, fortunately, we've been successful to do so. Um, and to briefly introduce the topic, my youngest daughter, as some of you know, she is not keen on any kinds of sports at all. She totally opposes the whole thing. But I have realized that she is spending quite a bit of time with computer, and uh, not only during the typical office hours that you would think that, okay, it's very normal for a person to, to use uh, computers, but during the nights as well, you know. She stays up too long, at least from my opinion, and she wants to sleep too late in the mornings, at least according to my opinion. And I've been wondering what, what is the, the sort of what, what is wrong? Can you just watch the movies with me or something like that? Like, come on, I also enjoy movies. And no, 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 I, I'm not interested in your movies. Or and then at some point, I, I was able to somehow get into this world of hers, which is about esports. Well, it was defined esports to me afterwards because at that time I just thought it was something very idiotic for young people to do and, and share because I didn't understand and comprehend the core at all. So when we start talking about esports, I think most of us in this room have got some kind of a pre assumption of what is what is it about. And, and we might have an idea what it's really about, but I am pretty sure that only few of us understand and realize the volume and the importance and, and actually the, well, the growth rate that this particular form of sports has. So now we have got the privilege to have Johan Järvinen here from Esports Finland. He is a journalist, but he's also a member of the board of Esports Federation in Finland. So please, the stage is yours, Johan. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Um, as said, my name is Johan Järvinen, or um, more generally in esports terms, I'm known as Sun Tzu. And yeah, we all use gamer handles, more or less. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about esports and uh, marketing. And uh, this is the agenda for the day. First, we're going to talk a bit about what is esports, a bit about the history of esports that sets up going into the streaming revolution, what it's meant in terms of bringing esports forward. And uh, then we're going to talk about the demographics of esports, why it's an interesting field and uh, marketing and then follow up with the Q&A. Um, but before we begin, just a quick bit about the Esports Federation in Finland. Um, it was started in December of 2011, and we're a umbrella organization for esports in Finland. We are a advocacy group, largely. We try to bring uh, Finnish esports uh, actors together, and we try to educate people and uh, raise awareness about Esports. So, what is esports? Um, I suppose the simplest answer is that it is computer games which you play competitively. But I don't think that's a very interesting answer. I think the more interesting thing is to look at it in context of what it is, how it looks related to sports. We have a younger demographic. This comes about because we've only existed for less than 20 years. Um, in actuality, the sort of spread of ages is not too different. It's just that we're missing that 50-plus demographic. 
So we, we're situated in that 1834 gap. We're more male dominated than traditional sports. And I know that's quite hard to, uh, to fathom, but that's because we combine technology and sports to fairly male dominated fields. And as a result, the numbers go from like 95% to 80% male. Um, we'll talk more about that later. We're natively digital. We started out in the digital space. Unlike modern sports who are coming to realize that the digital space is worthwhile and who are trying to expand into the digital space, we started here. That means that we have a completely different way of approaching things. Social media is a core part of eSports, Twitter and Reddit and stuff like that. If you follow the Reddit front page, Every so often, you'll find eSports news going up there at the very top of the Reddit front page, simply because our subreddits are incredibly powerful. And we were born global. We are playing games online to a large extent. And those games allow us to connect with people from very different countries and different communities come together. So there is a natural tendency towards being global. And we are highly disruptive. And by that, I mean that although we've only existed for 20 years, we've had whole games, whole genres of gameplay, which have come and gone within this short time span. And uh, that's going to continue happening. The average lifespan of an esports title is somewhere between five and 10 years. After that, it's gonna repl be replaced either by the next iteration of the game, or by a similar game, or maybe the whole genre dies out and some other genre comes in instead and grabs people's attention. So what makes an esports title? It has to be competitively viable. That means you have to have high levels of strategic engagement and mechanical engagement. You have, to be, have, you have to outthink your opponent and you have to outplay them. You have to uh, perform specific actions fast and accurately, and uh, that's a big part of it. You need a large and dedicated player base, simply because you have to sustain a game for five to 10 years, and those people have to be interested in watching the game, interested in talking about the game, interested in trying to understand the game. So it has to, it has to be enough of depth there that you can spend 10 years trying to figure out this game and you still don't know what's actually going on. There's still things you don't know. We're talking about player versus player and team versus team. You're not playing against the computer, you're playing against other human beings who are trying to outthink you, outplay you. Um, and these games are increasingly built for esports. Now when we started out, this wasn't the case. These were just multiplayer games that happened to evolve into esports. But now, game companies, because they realize the value of this market, they're building games from the ground up for esports, and they're supporting them for esports. And that's a very different approach. It means the <laughs> football doesn't change the rules all that often. Um, a game like Dota changes basically everything twice a year. And uh, that's, we balance things when you keep them fresh and the things change, the rules change, and you have to adapt constantly. Um, and you need the developer backing. By that, I mean not simply that the uh, developer of the game puts money out there and tries to buy itself into an eSport. That's generally not gonna work. Um, but that I, by that, I mean that the developer has to be committed to making this work as a competitive pursuit. Has to be committed to keeping it balanced, to keeping it interesting. And uh, here are some of the biggest current esports titles. I've organized them under their um, publishers. Activision Blizzard publishes Hearthstone, which is a competitive card game. StarCraft II, which is an RTS. Call of Duty, which is the biggest of the console shooters. Valve publishes Dota 2, which is a Dota game. 
<laughs> uh, or MOBA, if you want to be sacrilegious. Um, and they published Counter-Strike Global Offensive, which is the latest iteration of the team-based FPS Counter-Strike. And then Riot Games, who published the biggest esports title in the world right now, League of Legends, another MOBA title. Okay, so the history of esports. This timeline, I don't know how big it is, but well, it'll have to do. Um, I put as the starting point the release of Quake in 96. So that's just under 20 years ago. That's the first modern esports title. Um, it was followed up by other games like StarCraft and Counter-Strike, and those come in in those early, early years. Um, but the big, the big thing you need to realize here is that around 2004, we tried to go mainstream. We had what was known as the CPL World Tour. And um, it was televised, and we made compromises, and we did things to try and court the public opinion, try and get into the good graces of, of old media. And we did so for about four years until CPL uh, went bankrupt and until the esports scene crashed. Um, and things looked pretty dire for a short bit. However, there you see the new titles of the day cropping up. League of Legends in 2010, and Dota in 2011. We got the new CSGO. And in there, in between, is something called Twitch TV, which is a live streaming platform. And that is essentially the key to where we are today. So we had this sort of first boom, and I can show it, you, show it to you better here. This is a uh, totaling of the prize pools for esports for each year. Going back to those early days, and you see that 2000, 2004, uh, 2004 to 2008, that hump, and you see the crash. And if you're in esports back in 2008, and you're like, oh god, what's happening? And then it starts to rise. And that graph actually ends in 2014, and it ends at just over 30 million US dollars a year in prize money. Uh, we. I think we're closer to 60 million this year. Uh, Dota alone is giving out 30 million this year in prize money. So, you know, if you want to compete, you can make some money. I know, 16 year old millionaire. Um, so, the streaming revolution, what has enabled this? Well, Twitch has. It's the world's largest streaming platform. I'm, this is pretty a pretty Western-centric view of the whole thing, but you're going to have to bear with me. Um, it, is the, it is one of the 15 largest bandwidth consumers in the world. At peak times, I think it's closer to 2% of global bandwidth goes to people watching streams on Twitch. It, the big thing that I did was it bypassed our reliance on old media. We had our own distribution platform. We don't need TV. We don't need you. We're, we're, we've got our own thing going here. We can do it on our terms. And that changed everything, because that allowed us to build up things at our pace, in our way, and to learn on our own. Um, the other big thing that Twitch does when you're watching TV or just watching TV, when you're watching Twitch, you've got a chat on the side of the screen. You're communicating with other people watching the same game. OK, at, at some point when there's a million people watching, it's not so much communication. It's just people spamming Twitch memes. Um, but you know, you can get a lot across in spamming your random memes. But it, it brought the community together, and it brought us a sense of community, a sense of interaction. And uh, that's been especially important in terms of professional players who uh, have their personal streams and who engage personally with their fans. Uh, it's been likened to, let's say, take your favorite 
uh, sports star, let's say LeBron James, he puts on a GoPro and goes play basketball. That's the effective equivalent of a professional gamer sitting down to stream for his fans. Um, Twitch was bought by Amazon last year for $970 million. It was after YouTube was barred from buying it. So that was an interesting situation. And um, I'm going to show you a video to give you a bit of an idea of what an esports event, sort of the, what the production looks like. And I think it's going to look quite familiar in a way. Uh, da -da -da. began that has changed the face of competitive gaming. The International. A tournament summoning the finest Dota teams from across the globe. Since its creation, much has changed. against revered champions. The eyes of the world now turn to Key Arena, eager to witness history firsthand, hungry to watch the war unfold. Okay, so that was a introduction video for the International for this year. It was an $18 million prize pool, and uh, yeah, it was good fun. <laughs> um, this is a bit about the growth of Twitch. Uh, Twitch is North American, and you sort of think that um, everything on the internet is global. The fact that streaming takes up Uh, the fact is, streaming takes up a lot of bandwidth, so um, they had to expand their infrastructure, and they did so in, in the last couple of years, and this is sort of their numbers for growth outside of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. was their home base. Uh, so this is in millions of minutes watched per month, and why is it in millions of minutes watched per not month? It's because you can get to say you had six billion minutes watched. It's great marketing. Um, and as you see, uh, they started out January 2013 at six billion and got it up to 7.5 in, in a year, and then slight increase to 12 billion, yeah, whatever. Um, these are last month's statistics, according to Quantcast. Um, we don't have the exact numbers for Twitch, uh, because Twitch doesn't release their numbers that often. They usually do a yearly report. The last slide was from the last year's report. Um, what we're looking at here is 56.5 global unique viewers in the last 30 days on Twitch. And I think these numbers are low. Um, I'm pretty sure Twitch's previous own numbers are, uh, set it higher, and there hasn't been any shrinkage in the 
the viewer base, so yeah. So let's talk, get into the esports demographic and marketing. This is a bit of an overview from a super data report that came out, uh, I think, like a month ago. Uh, it has this year estimated at 750 million uh, for the size of the esports market. It's probably off because uh, I think after this was uh, un this report was published, uh, one of the Russian oligarchs announced he was putting 100 million into Virtus Pro. So you know that throws numbers off. Projected 2016 1.1 billion. Projected 2017 1.5. So we're gonna double it in in two years time. Um, and uh, projected 2018, almost $2 billion. And so uh, on the other side, we have the uh, distribution. Asia is the biggest. Asia is big because um, in the early, like late 90s, early 2000s, um, Korea had this whole market crash. They, they had, it was a terrible economic time in Korea. And they invested in uh, PC infrastructure, PC banks, what they call them, there's basically internet cafes. And that brought on uh, the adoption of StarCraft as essentially the national sport of Korea. And that has sen since then transitioned into, into uh, League of Legends. Um, but the places where it's growing right now is North America and Europe. And these numbers are going up rapidly. Um, this is from an Eventbrite study. They went to various esports events, looked at the demographics of the attending uh, individuals. Uh, they got it at 82% male, 18% female. 75% are 18 to 34 year olds. And 44% college students, mostly computer science, science, engineering, stuff like that. Uh, these, are, these numbers are for US and Europe. Um, so yeah, we are a, we're a pretty young demographic male and uh, heavily uh, science background. These are Quantcast's uh, demographics for Twitch. Uh, these are online numbers, so the numbers go quite a bit more male heavy. Um, this is a bit hard to account for, but you know, the idea is basically that probably more women attend with their boyfriends and such for the live events, whereas for the, uh, for the online event, online viewership, it's heavily male. It's also a bit younger online. Uh, we got that 26% under 18 year olds, but it's still over 50% of the demographic online is still 18 to 34 male. Um, the no college is higher online, but that's basically because we have, uh, we have a lower age group there. Uh, a lot of those will become college students, and it is heavily Caucasian, uh, because the Asians, of course, have other services usually in Korean or in Chinese, which they utilize. And um, esports in Finland. Esports in Finland revolves heavily around uh, LAN organizations. Uh, this is largely because we are sort of behind the curve, uh, but organizations such as Assembly and Lantric they are a big part of the, uh, the ecology of the Finnish esports. Um, it's a bit difficult to nail down the actual size of the Finnish esports viewing public. Um, I got it at about 70,000 daily Steam users. Steam is a platform for playing the Valve games. And 53% of those play CSGO, 20% play Dota. And uh, you'll probably find similar-ish, probably a bit higher numbers, for example, for league users and uh, for players of, of Blizzard games. 
So we're probably looking at like 200, 300,000 people total who play esports games, although not competitively in Finland. Uh, competitively, we have like hundreds of players about uh, who are like semi-pro and up. We have uh, active pro players in most titles. Uh, in terms of CS, we have Aulu, who is the big name right now. He plays for a Swedish organization called NIP. And um, in Hearthstone, we have Savits, who plays for Team Liquid. We have, in Dota, we have uh, Matumbaman and Jerax, who play for Team Liquid, as well as Stark, which is a wholly Finnish team. And uh, so on. In StarCraft, we have Elfie and uh, Velmo and Serat and so forth. Uh, on the side here, you see the uh, broadcasting numbers for Ule, uh, for their TV and uh, online streamed uh, content. Uh, this is in Finnish only uh, streamed content. And you can see that it topped off at above 90,000 viewers in Finland. Um, and it's been going down. And this is... Uh, kind of just indicative of the fact that Ule can't actually provide the same quality of commentary as, as the uh, English streams. And so, because the, the audience is so global, they're going to pick the international option. So while stream numbers internationally are going constantly upwards, if you can't compete with that, if you're old media and you can't compete, this is what happens. So you have to actually take this seriously, and then you can try and get into that market. And uh, the final slide. Esports marketing hot topics. Um, as I've outlined, we reach a valuable and elusive target audience. 1835 males are infamous for uh, being disengaged. We don't watch as much TV anymore. We don't read newspapers. We aren't really approachable through old media in many cases. I haven't owned a TV in 10 years. I'm sure there are others like me uh, in this audience today. So we eSports provides a means to engage with this demographic, which is so hard to get at. And we're in the middle of a huge growth boom with projected growth going way up. We are going to become mainstream, although we're going to become mainstream on our terms. However, there are some challenges here as well. We are global. That means that if you are trying to market from a geographically localized budget, and you're only looking for the numbers, you only want to see engagement in Finland, for example, you're going to have a hard time just engaging the Finnish audience. Even if you sponsor Finnish players, half their viewership, half their fan base is global. More than half, even, if they're big enough. So it's difficult to geographically target, but if sponsors sort of move their thinking away from targeting specific geographic regions and use the global marketing budget, so to speak, then you can get very good demographic information for who you're reaching, and you can reach a very broad spectrum of people in many different countries. And um, we are slowly getting pretty saturated with sort of uh, our, <laughs> our own companies. Uh, tech companies, peripheral companies, uh, beverage makers have been pretty active. Uh, Monster Energy, Red Bull, Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, stuff like that. But there are openings for conventional sponsors to get into this space. We're talking about young affluent males who are heading out of college, who are, heading, who are in college, heading out of college. They're probably going to look at, for example, buying their first new car. So you might, if you're a car manufacturer, you might want to market to them through this. They might be looking at starting families. If you're an insurance salesman you are, or banking, 
you might want to look at these ways to get a hold of this audience. There's huge openings for conventional sponsors because you don't have a lot of competition. Yet, you will if you wait. But um, for now at least, you have a chance. And um, I'm going to end this with a video. This is um, an uh, example of what marketing looks like in eSports. And it's from a, it's from a uh, tournament called The Summit. And The Summit is basically this North American studio who uh, handle broadcasting and commentary for eSports. Um, they all sort of li they've all gra gathered the whole crew into one house, and they use that as a broadcasting studio and base. And they wanted to open it up to teams, bring teams in, and do a sort of home-style tournament where you get really intimate and have a really intimate feel. And that opens it up for a lot of uh, different kind of marketing. And this is a video they made at the last one. Uh. Listen, guys, we need to have a talk about sponsorship obligations. The thing is, we signed a contract, and that means we got to give them some screen time. Well, that's where we disagree. Contractor, no, I won't bow to any sponsor. Isn't that right, Cuddle Guy? It's like, people only do things because they get paid. And that's just really sad. Listen, I'm sorry you feel that way, but that's just the nature of eSports. I can't talk about this anymore. I'm just feeling too tired. Here, drink one of these. Ah, refreshing. Look, you can work at the BTS studio, or you can go right back to work in a mom's basement. Your choice. We'll take that bet. Yeah, so. That's how we market in eSports. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Johan. Uh, I would say that the, the Twitter wall uh, apparently <coughs> somehow reflected the audiences. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not surprised. Or, or, or I'm not surprised. Yeah, so there's a lot of Q&A, I think. Or, or is it just... Please go away and leave us in peace because we believe in the true sport. We are the true believers of the one sport God. The one true God, yeah. The true yeah. sports, you know, blood and sweat and tears and, you know, heartbeats and, and you know, goals and, and, you know, sneakers and all, all that important stuff you need, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so I is agree. there any questions you'd like to add to this uh, <laughs> short introduction of mine? Please do. Okay, Yuha, please start from there. Okay, thanks, Johan, for a great presentation. This was really unknown territory to me until my own son went to study exchange to South Korea. <laughs> and I asked the famous question, what is the na national sport in South Korea? And the, my son told e-sports. And I uh, no, asked, what is the favorite sport? And now I got more into it, but may I ask you, now not in the role of a federation, but as a player, Sanju, right? Um, I'm not really a player. I'm, I'm just everyone has a gamer handle because everyone's been a gamer at some point. But, yeah. but I have a few short questions because I try to understand the similarities to true sports, as Arista said. <laughs> so if you are a top level player, yep. you have a brand, right? Yes. People know you. Yes. Do you have your own web page, most likely? Um, generally not, but like the whole, I mean, who uses web pages anymore? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking. Like, okay. you, have, you, have your, you have your Twitter page. Uh, you might have a Facebook page, but who uses Facebook anymore? 
uh, you might, if you're Russian, you have your VK page. If you're uh, Chinese, you have your Tencent page. Uh, yeah. Okay, you have those. Do you have, you belong to a team? Yeah, the team has a website. Because okay. teams are old school that way. Do you have a contract with the team? Yes. How long? Uh, that depends. Uh, in certain sports, in certain uh, esports, you have these roster lock periods, and um, those contracts are usually uh, about a year or so. Uh, in some cases, teams choose to lock down players for multiple years. There was recently a signing, LJD signed their mid player, maybe, for uh, three years. Uh, He's a huge growing talent, so they wanted to lock him down. Um, on the short end, it can be as low as like six months or so. Okay, do you have an agent? Um, generally not at this point, which is, I mean, th this is a very much a growing, uh, growing side of the business. We're gonna see more agents uh, in the future. We've got esports lawyers coming in, helping players with the contracts. We've got people from the game uh, publishers who are uh, helping uh, players with the advocacy and so forth. Uh, but C can yeah. I bet your games with my bookmaker? Yes. Um, I've, I've, I've recently had the enjoyable experience of trying to bet on Bet365 on, on Dota, and we've, we're in like the most volatile period in, in Dota history right now, <laughs> and, uh, and it's not fun. But yeah, uh, more and more of these online bookmakers are uh, featuring esports titles. Uh, also, Bakehouse has been featuring some esports titles and stuff like that. Have you ever had a game fixing scandal? Yes. Uh, that's happened in South Korea, that's happened in uh, Southeast Asia, and you know, stuff like that. Uh, it's usually the smaller markets. Um, it's usually underpaid players. Uh, the more we get into a more professional mode, uh, the less the risk of that is, simply because the uh, benefits aren't there. You know, the the risk of ge of getting caught is too high. Everything's digital. Everything's everyone. Everything's got a footprint. So usually people get caught. Okay. Do you discuss doping and health? Of your players? Uh, yes, uh, there was a uh, there was a recent thing where a um, North American uh, Counter Strike team they attended a, an event, and after the event, one of the players who had been kicked from the team uh, in an interview talked about how the, the whole team was on Adderall at the event, and after that. Um, ESL, the, uh, one, one of the biggest tournament organizers, they started an official partnership with the, uh, uh, what is the uh, global uh, drugs, uh, whatever, uh, drugs testing, uh, and um, they're now introducing drugs testing at ESL events. So you are a true sport, thank you for your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Johan. That was thorough. Okay, Johan was a journalist, and, and <laughs> maybe still is never so he has the problem. It's a handicap, apparently. Uh, any other sort of kind questions or, or <laughs> more? Yeah, more I'll take the unkind as well. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. uh, how many jobs do you think there's going to be in Finland related to esports in like maybe next 10 years? How many what? Jobs. Available. Jobs. Uh, that depends a lot. Um, the big question for us is how do we grow? We, we need sort of a, uh, a uh, Finnish big tournament. And there might be some developments, but I can't really discuss them. <laughs> but um, I think there's room for a big tournament to be hosted in, in uh, Finland. and. With that, you'd get the whole tournament crew that's, that works out of Finland and jobs in that respect. Uh, you've also got Finnish uh, esports organizations who are trying to make it happen. Uh, but realistically, same as, as in traditional sports, Finland is more of a exporter of talent. Um, 
it doesn't really make a lot of sense for us to try and compete as whole Finnish teams. It makes more sense for the best of us to go out there and compete with international teams. So um, the amount of jobs in Finland in, in terms of esports, hard to say. But if you want to relocate to Germany, or if you want to relocate to Sweden, or if you want to go to New York, or da 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 there are jobs to be had. Okay, next question is over here. Hello. Uh, my, my best friend uh, at Kajani is a very good talent. Now, now I know that I can be rich <laughs> with, <laughs> with my <laughs> talent friend. But ha hey, how long it takes that you, you are coming to good uh, player? Um, uh, it depends. Um, the fact that a lot of these games, they since they have these big balance, balance patches which change the nature of the game, that sort of resets the knowledge advantage to a bit every so often. So uh, the, the advantage that someone who's played for 10 years isn't overwhelming. You can come in with a couple of years of, uh, of playing if you've worked hard enough and you have enough talent. Um, I think the shortest I, I've seen is like about a year to be able to play on a professional team, but you're not going to be a top talent at that point. You need like two, three years maybe to be absolute top talent. And that's with a lot of natural talent as well and a lot of dedication. Uh, probably most in this room have has played FIFA or NHL <laughs> computer games. Do you think, is there potential for those games of traditional sports to become one of the big ones that you already showed over there? No. <laughs> I mean, why would I, why would I want to play football uh, on a computer or a console? I can go play football in the park or, you know, at the local pitch, um, you know. Uh, no, but like the problem there is that it's not particularly engaging. I don't think, at least, it might be approachable at at, at the start. But in terms of uh, esports, I mean, everyone's a gamer these days. Everyone growing up is a gamer, so uh, the whole approachable discussion is sort of out the window. We've all played FPS games. You can all understand. If I'm running around aiming, a, aiming the barrel at someone, I'm trying to get a headshot, you can understand what the concept is. So it's not that difficult. And in that sense, it's rather a bit more interesting. And the rules are made today, not like in football 100 years ago. So Yeah, yeah. Um, and the rules, and, and especially in terms of, of games like FPS, the whole game physics, it's not a given how, how high you can jump, how fast you can run. These are things you can adjust, and they change the pace of the game. They change how you play the game. They change how long it takes for you to get to a given, given point in, in the, on the map. And that changes sort of the dynamics of the game. And these are all things that you can muck about with in eSports games. Yes, OK. There are a few questions that I uh, have been handed, actually. Uh, one question, eSport is rapidly growing business. How big do you think it will be in 10 years from now? <laughs> uh, no idea. Uh, I, I think we're going pretty much mainstream in 10 years, but who knows. Um, we've got, we're, we're, at, we're at the point where a lot of old media is coming to us hat in hand and saying, hey, please, would you like to be on our platforms now? And uh, that's a pretty good point to be in terms of uh, trying to reach the people who haven't heard of esports yet. But in reality, we don't kind of need that. We're going to grow on the, in the online space for at least the next few years. Um, I, think, I think we're headed up there to become on the level of, of uh, traditional sports not probably the whole of traditional sports put together, but like in terms of uh, an NBA or an NHL, we're going to rival those in scope and, and influence. Okay, there's another question, apparently from somebody who's been 
consuming sports <laughs> very much as, as some kind of a VIP guest. Uh, hospitality services included. So what kind of a VIP section or do you have lounges <laughs> for these eSport games? Um, yeah, this has been a discussion recently because everyone wants to offer VIP tickets and VIP services and uh, in the past, the, the big selling point of VIP tickets at events was that you got to uh, sort of engage with the players. However, the players are starting to increasingly not want to be disturbed because there's actually a whole lot of money to be won and they kind of want to focus on the game. Uh, so right now, the big discussion is, uh, are the VIP tickets doing enough for the, for the prices of them? But yeah, we have VIP sections at most events and that can involve catering, that involves special seating, that involves tickets to the after party, and you know, we like to party. After parties everywhere, yep. Um, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, true athletes, as said. You yes. <coughs> yeah. You have stated already one question before Kari wants to hit one. So there's one question apparently, very eager getting into this business. How can a small entrepreneur or a small investor get into this growth rate that you have in, in eSports? Is there a way in to benefit out of your growth? Um, it depends what you're, what you're sort of looking to do. If you're just looking to be a angel investor, then uh, I'd say various betting sites and fancy eSports and stuff like that. Fancy eSports is a bit of a problem because there was uh, recently the Nevada Gaming Council, I think, came out with a uh, ruling that fancy sports is actually gambling. So there's a bit of a problem there, but that was a big growing section. Uh, I think it made, about, uh, made up like $7 million uh, revenue this year for esports. Um, so that might be something where you could look to get in. Um, if you're a sponsor, uh, if you're like, a company who wants to get in uh, on the cheap, I'd say the most underused venue is probably direct sponsorship of players. You pick out a player who embodies your brand's aspirations. Say you're a healthy living lifestyle brand. You might uh, pick a guy called Tal Isaac, AKA Fly. He's a Dota player, his father, founded Commando Krav Maga. He's a uh, licensed instructor of Commando Krav Maga. Um, he looks like a licensed instructor of Commando Krav Maga, and he's a huge health nut. Um, and you could sponsor a guy like him, or you could take the uh, Polish Counter-Strike player, uh, Pasha Biceps. His calling card is, Biceps be with you. He's a nice guy. He, he, he speaks this, this lovely broken English, but it's so endearing, and he's this huge health nut, and yeah. You've got choices. <laughs> well, in, in fact, this is Risto's question, and I was just wondering why he is not asking this. I have a, one quick proposal for, for you, and uh, it's a good sponsor for you, and it is the Solar Cell Company, because however you are reliable, on electricity. Yeah, that might be interesting. Um, as said, we have a, a fairly um, uh, well-educated demographic, so a lot of people who probably care about global warming and sort of the future of the planet and corporate social responsibility and all these things. So that kind of sponsorship might well work out in our field as well. Who knows? Is it a tax-free business? Nope. You have to pay taxes. Only two things are certain in life, death and taxes. Good, okay, let's wrap this up a bit. So there's a last question. Um, what do you think? What could, okay, this true sport, while referring to the traditional formats of sports, what do you think it could learn <coughs> from, from from your sports, and especially, you know, when it comes to this, uh, your fan engagement and, and your understanding of, of your clients and, and spectators and people being fanatic about it, knowing so much about it, 
What do you think? What should the traditional sports organizations learn from you? We're quite a bit out ahead uh, of traditional sports in terms of utilizing social media, in terms of uh, engaging fans on various platforms. Um, the fact, letting fans into the, the sort of locker room experience, the behind the scenes experience, letting fans build up this sense of personal engagement with the stars, that I think is something that they can certainly learn from us. Uh, a lot of the esports superstars aren't just superstars because they're incredibly talented, it's superstars because they have incredibly likable personalities. They are, they embody competitor and enter entertainer in one. And that's something that we've been pretty good at, at marketing, especially with the advent of streaming, because a lot of players al also stream, they also engage with their fans that way, and the streaming is essentially, uh, you are being a entertainer, a presenter to your fans and so forth. So that, that's, that's a big thing. Um, also, we just, we do demographics better, I think. Um, every streaming platform, because it's digital, you get uh, all kinds of demographic data, you get data for, you know, uh, people from, from what countries people are tuning in and uh, for how long and all, all, all that data. And uh, the data breakdown that a, team can give you in terms, uh, as a sponsor, the, the data breakdown they can gi give you about the audience and the reach of their team is very, uh, very solid. Good. Um, how about, do you get any funding, any like public funding to eSports, like to support you to do what you're doing, uh, as eSports usually gets? It depends. Um, like the Finnish eSports Federation is uh, publicly funded. It's funded by the Finnish government. Um, and uh, we had recently, for example, the Philippines um, have taken upon it upon them to uh, embrace Mineski, I think, which is their biggest uh, eSports brand, uh, embrace that as the sort of national team and invest in them as a national, uh, na national um, ambassador for esports. Uh, in Malaysia, um, the, uh, th there's uh, some similar things going on. And, uh, but by and large, we are driven by, uh, by sponsorships from the private sector. Okay, maybe these are the two last questions. Now, is, is there anything coming from the audience? Okay, there'll be one. Awesome. Oh, okay, two. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, it's working. Okay, um, thanks for the presentation um, about how do you see the Finnish esports in future, where we are going, because as from the pictures, we can see the major size events like Club Napoca, which was held in Romania two weeks ago. So. Can we get to that level, and when when would it be in the, that level in Finland? I think the big Kickstarter for us is going to be um, getting national sponsorships involved in national competitions, and like uh, we have Assembly, which is the biggest Finnish uh, event. But the thing is, it's not actually an esports event. It's it's a demo party. It's a LAN party. Um, and uh, what they did in Sweden, they had a similar event called DreamHack. Uh, and they went heavily for eSports uh, back in 2010. And in five years now, they've grown that into one of the biggest tournament organizers in the world. And they're holding, for example, this Cluj Napoca event was, I believe, done by DreamHack. Um, so it's pretty easy and pretty fast to get there, but someone has to be interested in in helping out and getting things started. Um, for DreamHack, the big sponsor that was pushing it was a, uh, I believe a telecommunications company who wanted them to test out just how much they could stress their bandwidth. So uh, that's one way. Um, but yeah, we need sponsors and we need people who want to, uh, want to help grow esports. And with that, 
we can create a strong uh, home market as well. Hey, I, I want to ask actually a few things. You mentioned about the bandwidth. How are the operators reacting to this? Are <laughs> they happy with this? I have actually no idea. <laughs> Um, I don't think I don't think operators have much of a say in the whole thing, but yeah, we we do we do our part in terms of stressing global bandwidth. Uh, but mostly, the thing is, uh, in terms of of streaming, the the streaming companies build up their own infrastructure, uh, so they have their own servers and distributing uh, content uh, to these servers and so forth. Uh, and that's a lot more important than uh, than the individual sort of uh, uh, bandwidth providers, internet service providers. Uh, how about your personal opinion on physical health? You mentioned there's lots of really young men and they are playing hours in a day. There's lots of studies also shown that sitting is not that healthy for you. How do you see that? Could that be something we could do as normal? <laughs> or I think, um, <laughs> yeah, well, fair enough. We're the abnormals here, sure. Um, yeah, no, but um, I think uh, when we started out I I with eSports, um, the approach was just, you know, focus on the games. But the fact is, if you're going to compete at one of these big events, you're doing, uh, eight to 12 hour days. You're not doing one hour of, uh, of uh, physical activity. You have to stay alert and able to compete for eight to 12 hours. That's a huge drain on your stamina. You're flying around the world to compete at these events. That's going to stress your body. So increasingly teams are coming to the realization that they have to care about their physical health. So at least in terms of the competitors, there is a realization that physical health matters. And um, I think that's probably going to, that, that can, can be used to trickle down to the fans as well. Uh, that's up to uh, lifestyle sponsorships and whatever to sort of incentivize doing that, that work. Has that been seen yet in sponsors or? No, we haven't really seen lifestyle sponsors like that. Um, there's there's some, some players who just uh, who uh, take it upon themselves to sort of talk about their gym routines and their eating and lifestyle routines and stuff like that. Uh, but it's it's not driven yet by any kind of sponsorships. Uh, these are these are the kinds of things we're still a very young feel in that sense. So there's a lot of room to develop. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the questions. And now uh, we're going for the break. But yes, now I think I have got a better <laughs> picture of my daughter, who's very weird since she's just amongst the 8% of of the people being that interested, you know, being it's a girl okay. being we, we We love to have more women in esports. Um, I know the online space isn't always too welcoming to women. Please trust me in saying that uh, it's, a, it's a small minority who aren't welcoming. The, ma the majority of people you're going to meet are going to try to be accommodating and they, they want you there. Yeah, and the other thing that I notice is now I know where the spectators of the ice hockey and football matches are because <laughs> they are playing that. And I think that we should probably reconsider what we are doing in our marketing so that we can <laughs> probably get them back to spectate the traditional sports. We'll sport. Thank you, you very them. much, Ivan. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Big applause. So we continue at...